Hi guys and dolls and welcome back to the Janae Wall Show. Um, in this video I have Miss Clarissa Harding, author of Some of Us Leave, her story with domestic violence. Um, and just to let you know some of the content of this discussion may be sensitive for some viewers so viewer discretion is advised. Okay, so this is her book right here, Some of Us Leave. Okay, um, Miss Clarissa, would you like to take us through why you wrote this book? I wrote this book because I didn't want anybody else to experience the journey that I did. Um, it was hard, it was scary, it was emotional, it was, it was bad. Take me through. So you're about, I think, 18 at the time. You decided to enlist for the Air Force. Right. And what was um, that beginning of your experience like? Oh, it was great. Um, basic training. Uh, for some people, they felt like it was really hard, but for me, it was really fun. Uh, I got in trouble for laughing in basic training, so it was pretty fun for me. Um, it was. You did a lot of exercising, and it was a lot of yelling and all that other stuff, but it didn't really phase me. It was great. Well, thank you so much for your service. Thank you. Um, and so you run into this guy, and um, we we have different names for the people. We don't. We're not going to list their real name. But you run into this guy named Mr. Pilot. You uh -huh. call him Mr. Pilot. And tell me what your relationship was like with Mr. Pilot. Well, Mr. Pilot and I uh, met in technical school. That's where they send you for training for the military. So we met in technical school. We were both on night shift. We were in separate classes, but we were doing the same training. Um, he was a really nice guy. He was friendly. He was generous. He was he was weird to me at the time because I wasn't used to guys um, being gentle, caring, sweet. I mean, he bought me roses like the first week he met me, and the second week he was just ready to get married. I was like, oh, wow. Um, so it sounds like uh, you had a pretty good relationship with Mr. Pilot as yeah, far as how he treated you. Then you run into this guy named Mr. Accent. Yes. Okay, tell me about the first incident that you had with Mr. Accent that caught you completely off guard. The first incident was uh, we had gone out to the club. Um, I had a great time. I danced all night. Um, it was just great. Uh, when we got back to the dorm, usually we would go back to his place, but instead he said, I'm going to take you to the dorm. I think that it'd be best for you to stay in the dorm. So he took me to the dorm and um, I, I just remember standing there and all of a sudden he just slapped me and he slapped me so hard that I fell to the floor. And I don't know what was going on in me exactly, but as soon as he did it, I felt like I had did something wrong instead of um, him being done something wrong. Uh, I just remember apologizing to him. He hit me and I was apologizing to him because I was scared that whatever I did, I mean, it must have been really bad. I didn't even know what it was. It must have been really bad for him to actually strike me. So that was the first time. And Mr. Accent, he, what was his position or rank? He was related he, to your... He, he worked in the same building that I did. Like, his office was in the back, mm -hmm. and my office was in the front. So he worked in the same building that I did, and it wasn't a very large building. And uh, he outranked me, because I was just coming into the military. I, don't, I didn't have any stripes at the time, and he was a staff sergeant, so... Um, he definitely outranked me, and um, and my boss was afraid of him, so that didn't help either. Do you think maybe because of his position or rank, and when he hit you, that um, because of his status, that that you really must have done something wrong? Because this person is in the Air Force; they hold such a uh, high status, right. were you like caught off guard that that would even happen? I was completely caught off guard. Completely. Wow. Um, and so, um, so you spent a lot of time with Mr. Accent. 
uh, mostly going to the club, finding yourself really alone, sitting at a table, drinking just to pass time because yes. he was just doing whatever. Um, you were nervous to dance with guys or to even talk to anybody because he had this control issue. Yes, he was very, very jealous, very jealous. So anytime we would go to the club um, and we would go and he would find us a table and we, I'd sit down at the table and he'd bring me a drink and the only time he came to the table was to bring me drinks. He never sat with me, he never sat and talked with me, we never enjoyed conversation and he didn't like to dance so therefore I wasn't dancing so I was like well why did he even bring me? So you were spending a lot of time with him, um, staying at his place, you were doing um, a lot of cooking, you were often spending most of your paycheck on getting the house ready, getting groceries, um, because he never really gave you money. Even though he had expectations of you to get things, he never pitched in to pay right. for anything. Right. Um, you were cooking and he decided to do what one day when he thought that you were being too clumsy. Oh, one day I remember cooking, I was cooking breakfast and he, um, he heard me go, ouch! And he was like, what happened? And I was like, I burnt my arm. And he said that, um, he wanted to help me not to be so clumsy. So every time I bumped into something, burned my arm or whatever, he would punch me. And the punches got harder and harder. So... That day, I remember that day, I was like, okay, what am I going to, I got to do my hair. How am I going to do my hair without burning myself? I'm already nervous to curl my hair because he said that. And um, I was afraid to do anything. Wow. Um, you had a friend named Sheila. How was she of support for you? Um... I'm trying to remember which one of my names, Sheila. I think it was the one that lived around the corner. Uh, Sheila would come and pick me up. She would, uh, some days, she knew what was going on because we had, have a, we had had a conversation. So some days she would come by the house and be like, she's going with me. And he would just look at her and laugh. I'm like, wow, I wish I could talk to him like that. And she would say, um, and we're leaving right now. And he would just look at her and laugh and then he would tell me I could go. And I would go and spend time with her. And uh, she was really nice. She was very friendly. She's very supportive. Anytime I um, had a bad night or something like that, I could call her. And she would come and get me. Of course, after he's, he's left the house. Because I couldn't leave while he was there. Because I was afraid to. Wow. Um, so you're back in your dorm for a little bit. You're feeling alone, um, and I believe an incident happened prior to this, and Mr. Accent shows up. Um, tell me what happens next when he comes, comes to your dorm, um, and I think this was after another, another incident. Um, it, usually the only time I ended up back in the dorm is when he beat me or something like that, so um, he would come to the dorm and... Uh, just knock on the door and just look at me and, and I would just be so elated that he actually showed up that uh, he never apologized, he never said he was sorry, he never, there was no remorse in him. But he would just come and say something like, you want to go to go have some drinks? You want to come go to the club with me? I think, well, when I went to the club with you last time I got beat up, I don't want to go to the club anymore. So um, I remember eventually just saying, I just want to stay home. And eventually he would let me just stay home. Around um, the time that his nephew came over, he went out late. He came back home and um, you were awakened how? Oh, was that the time he woke me up strangling me? Yes, I think Oh that's my God, that was so scary. He was asleep, at least he acted like he was asleep. And his hands were just around my throat and he was just choking me, choking me, choking me. His fingernails, I could feel his fingernails all in my neck the way he was choking me. And when he woke up, he apologized and said he was sorry that um, he never wanted to hurt me 
that he he loved me or something. I, I can't remember exactly. But um You were just in shock. I was just like just laying there with my eyes all big, like, oh my god, he just tried to kill me in his in my sleep. What is he gonna do when he wakes up? It was bad. It was a really bad experience. It was really bad. But that was the first, it that seemed like that was the first time that he had like just a little bit of remorse. Wow. And I think I'm pretty sure he was drinking that night. Oh yeah, he smelled just like alcohol and sweat and stank. <laughs> and he was so controlling that he, he said that you could only use three squares of the toilet paper. Is that right? That is right. So one day, um... I went to the bathroom at his place and um, we were running out of toilet paper. So I came and I told him, I was like, hey, we need to, we're running out of toilet paper. No big deal to most people. Um, well, it must have triggered something in him because he got really mad and beat me up for using too much toilet paper. And then he made a rule that no matter what I'm doing in the bathroom, I can only use three squares. Three squares. Three squares. Okay, so um, some of the people where you work are starting to pick up on some of the things that are going on because you find yourself in the bathroom crying a lot and now you have um, physical scars and marks um, of Mr. Accent doing this to you. And what it, what's, what's going through your mind now that you're being called in by your supervisor to speak with your commander? It really, I was embarrassed, I was scared, I had no idea what my commander wanted to talk to me about, number one, um, but I go in there and I sit down after we do the military stuff, you know, um, and he asked, he told me I can go and sit down on his couch and he sat down with me and he was kind of like, um, I guess like kind of took his commander hat off and put his dad hat on and he talked to me and he was very very caring very supportive and he just told me all you have to do is tell us when you're ready to leave him <clears throat> so um, he said I don't care what day or time it is you call the first sergeant and we'll get people over there to get you moved out but we can't do anything unless you say, unless you press charges. He said, if you press charges, there's lots I can do. I really want you to press charges. But uh, I couldn't. Your commander says to you, you know some women and men in your situation do not get to leave because they don't live. Their abusive partners, their abusive partner ends up killing them. What is going through your mind as he's saying this? Are you like, well, Mr. Accent loves me. He would never do that. That's exactly what was going through my mind. He loves me. He would never hurt me. Even though he's hurt me all the time, he would never kill me. That's, that's crazy. That would never happen. So you go to the club again, sitting there, drinking alone. Mr. Accent comes over and... Um, I believe this was around the 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 time where um, he thought you were. There was a guy. Oh, he thought away. I was flirting with his friend. Yes, and uh -huh. tell me what happens when he comes over. He came over and he said something like, "You having a good time tonight, huh?" Uh, I can't remember what I what is what he said. Oh, I remember. You having a good time tonight, huh? We're going to have a good time when we get back home, too. And then I was just like, oh, my God. I'm just sitting here at the table. And it seemed like that guy was just like, he was just staring at me, staring at me, staring at me. And so, you know how if somebody's staring at you, you kind of look down and then peep over and see if he's still looking at you. That was all I did. Mm -hmm. But that, that jealousy button in him was... Wow. Wow. And so, was this the night where you ran to the bar, you went behind the bar for help? Oh, 
and nobody was trying to help me. I ran behind the bar, I'm screaming, I probably was crying and looking crazy, and, and people wouldn't help me. I think it just seemed like people were afraid of him. Nobody would, nobody ever stepped in to help. My girlfriends would help, and he wouldn't do anything when they were around. Mm -hmm. But anywhere else, nobody would jump in to help. The bartender, though, he calls the police, right? Yes, that time the bartender called the police. My first sergeant came, police came. It was just a mess, and I, then I was really scared. I'm like, oh my God, if he gets in trouble and they mess with his rank or something like that, then I'm really going to be in trouble. He's never going to want me back. So you were more protective of him and making sure that his career doesn't get messed up more than your own safety. sense of self-worth mm -hmm. and safety. Definitely. Wow. Um, your niece stays with both of you for about a week. Um, and Mr. Axel's attitude has changed. He's more kind. He's more oh, gentle. Oh, he was so great with her. And this was a side he that you've never so seen. He was so great with her. Oh, he was like... You want to take, you can drop me off at work, you can keep the car. I was like, keep the car? He's never let me keep the car. You can keep the car, take her to the park or something, y'all just have fun. So I leave, I'm driving, trying to be real careful because I didn't want to get any scratches on his car. I, you know, nothing to happen to this car. And uh, me and my niece, we go and we have fun in the park and everything. But the thing that I was watching, I was in the kitchen cooking, and uh, him and my niece was just wrestling and playing, and she was just... She was just having a ball, and um, I just kept looking at him. And I was like, oh, man, maybe that's what I should do. Maybe I should have a baby. If I had a baby, then he'd be nice all the time. Mm -hmm. That crossed my mind. Wow. Definitely crossed my mind. Wow, because he was, it he was, was a different side of yes. him you never saw before. He was loving, he was gentle, he was fun. He was just... Like night and day. Do you believe that was a facade that he put on because your niece was there? Or do you think he really enjoyed being a part of um, enjoying, you know, her company? I think he really, he was really having fun with her. Okay. He was really having fun. Because this little thing that, that, that he did, it was really funny. That my niece did, it was really funny. They were playing holding their breath and stuff. So she held her hand over his, his mouth and his nose and she said, uh, that's not fair. You're breathing through your eyes. So it was this really funny thing that happened. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed because she thought he was breathing through his eyes. Aww. So, I mean, it was, it was a really cute moment. And it, it really touched me. I was like, oh, so now that he's this nice guy, we can really be happy together. Wow. But, wow. She, but we had to take her back home. And he went back to being... He went right back. So, um... The night he played poker with his friends, you were even nervous just to even leave the bedroom, just to even communicate with his friends to pour them something to drink. Um, and he asked you to order some pizza, which he was in a good mood because you thought that he was winning poker. Yes, so yes. So you order the pizza, the guy, is, the guy is at the door, but you're nervous to even get the door because out of his extreme jealousy you don't want to do something in his eyes. I don't want to bring no attention to me. Uh -uh. Right. Um, so he says that you can get the door because you're hiding out in the bedroom. The doorbell is ringing and he says you can get the door. Um, his friends leave and, and tell me what happened later on that night that just shocked you. Uh, later on that night when he First, when the, a guy was sitting at the table and I fixed him, I fixed um, Mr. Axon a drink. And the guy asked for a drink too, so I fixed the guy a drink. And I looked at him when I was handing him the drink. And I was like, oh God, what have I done? So immediately, I didn't say anything else. I just tried to get out of the room. So therefore, that's why I was kind of another reason why I was hiding in the bedroom. So I'm back there in the bedroom, and I just kept thinking about, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, what am I going to do? So I, when he came to bed, I pretended I was asleep. Didn't matter whether I was asleep or not. He started beating me up. And he, he beat me up pretty good that night. And he actually won in poker. 
what you were hoping if he went in poker, he that was he'd be in a good mood school. and forget all about everything. Wow. Um, and this time you find yourself in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. um, you have to do a CT scan because you're feeling nauseous, nauseous, and you have. They're not sure something was going on with your your head or your feeling oh, dizzy. Oh, that was when he head butted me. Yes. Oh, he head butted me and my head swelled up. Oh my God, it was huge. And uh, that was a terrible day. That was a terrible time. I remember um, leaving his apartment and running all the way to the post, getting to the visitor center. I have no idea, I have nothing. I'm crying, I'm, I'm crying, I just, I look bad, I'm sure. So I'm there and I'm hiding out in the bathroom. He figures out where I am. He comes into the visitor center and he's screaming and cussing and acting all kind of crazy and banging on the bathroom door. And he kept saying, you're embarrassing me and da 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 You're doing this and you're doing that. I'm going to get you when I get in there. I'm going to get you when I get in there. And these guys are at the visitor center. Nobody calls the police. Nobody says, what are you doing? Nobody does anything. So I'm in the bathroom just crying, crying, crying and Three, four hours later, he finally leaves. And the guy at the visitor center knocks on the door and says, Ma'am, he's gone. And I was like, did you call the police? He was like, no. Mm. So uh, I had to figure out a way to get on base after that. You think they were scared of him? I do. Because his eyes, he looked so crazy that day. Wow. Oh, it was horrible. So you're at the hospital and the photographer starts taking pictures, collecting evidence, and you didn't even realize all the marks, all the scars, all the bruises, and um, the police are interviewing you, and you were asked again if you wanted to press charges, and what did you say? I said no. So this is from page 196. This is what you said. He would kill me if I pressed charges. I think he would kill me. My mind continues to race. What if pressing charges damages Mr. Axon's career? What if he cannot re-enlist? Will pressing charges cause him to go to jail? Will he get kicked out of the military? That would inevitably cause him to hunt me down and kill me. He threatened to kill me before. He told me if he can't have me, no one will. I hope the police don't hurt him. I hope he doesn't get injured or hurt in jail. I can't press charges. I'm scared of what the outcome will be. I'm afraid I will lose him. I'm worried no one else will want to be with me after getting him in trouble. I feared what problems Mr. Accent would experience after that. No one would protect me from him. No one has ever stepped in to help me. People seem to be afraid of him anyway. I live on base and he has access to the whole place. He knows everybody and there's no way that I would be safe there. There is no getting away from this guy. So you were more protective of him and you were so scared to press charges because you felt like even if you did that, that no one was going to be able to be there for you in a way that he would find you wherever you yeah. were at. I, I truly believe that he knew everybody. Everybody knew him. Hey, he knew everybody everywhere we went. Wow. Everywhere. And if he wanted to come to the dorms, all he had to do was drive his car up and go right in. Come right into, go right to my room. And he knew the dorm manager, so he really, he probably could have got a key to my room. He, he would have gave it to him. That's he would have gotten me. He would have gotten me. We will be back after the break. You're watching the Janae Wall Show. Da, da. <laughs> That's Steve Harvey's. Um, I need one for me. Hi guys and dolls. I want to show you what I have on my lips. It's from Janae Cosmetics, my own makeup line, and it's in the shade I Am Healed. And this is one of our liquid lipsticks. Um, so you can purchase at JanaeCosmetics.com. Now back to the show. Welcome back to the Janae Wall Show. I'm here with Miss Clarissa Harding sharing her story on Some of Us Leave. Um, and we're just, um, talking about her experience. So, 
Mr. Accent was still trying to call you. So this was after the hospital incident. And he spent, I think, a day in jail. He too. He's still trying to call you, and he's saying he's sorry, and blah, blah, blah. And he called you so much that you actually ripped the phone off the wall. I did. I ripped the phone off the wall, and uh, then I just kind of freaked out because I, it was like I needed to know that he was still calling. Mm. So then I was just really messed up. So then all I could do was just lay around and cry. Because a part of you still wanted him to want yes, you. I, I still wanted him. I wanted to, I wanted him, but I wanted the him like when he was with my niece. Right. And I knew that was in him, and I figured there was some kind of way that I could bring that out of him instead of the aggressiveness. So you eventually plug the phone back in. You hear a message, um, and it says many, many horrible things, but the scariest thing of all that you heard was, I will kill you before anyone else have you. Did you believe him when he said this? Oh yeah, I did. So now this is really starting to sink in after multiple incidences of him putting his hands on you, you being in the hospital. Um, so you go to the Best Western with your friends and you had spent some time away from Mr. Accent for a while. I don't know, was it days or Seems weeks? Seems like it may have been a week or so. So you go to the Best Western, you step away to go to the restroom real quick, and what happens out of the blue? Out of the blue, I feel somebody snatching me by my hair. And I scream. And uh, I just remember screaming and... Um, the guy that was with us, he was just a friend of ours coming over to try and help. I just remember uh, them tussling or whatever. I know he broke that guy's arm. Your friends? Yeah, the, the he, one who was trying to help me. He, he broke his arm. He broke his arm. He broke his arm getting to me. And I remember I, I remember the sore spot in my head from where he yanked me by my hair, trying to drag me out of that restaurant. I believe the police were called then, and uh, he got arrested again. But once again, you did not. I couldn't press charges. Couldn't press charges. Um, so you go back to his place, and um, still thinking that you can change him, and maybe that other side of him will come out. Um, he wants to teach you how to drive stick shift, and you're like, this is not good, because... He That's was already not good. Yes. angry he's, about something. He's already mad that we had to go to the store. I can't remember what we want. Oh, I think that was after the soccer, wasn't it? I can't remember exactly, but I know that he um, he said, I get tired of taking you to the store. Da, 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 da. So um, he wanted to teach me how to drive the stick. So when you drive a stick, you have to know how to um, do the clutch and the, and the gas at the same time. So the car will keep going and, and you're driving and the car kept cutting off. Every time the car cut off, he punched me. So uh, I'm driving and driving. And I remember being on a little bitty hill and the car started rolling back and cut off. And he punched me again. And... I kept trying to trying and trying to go up that hill. That's something that's hard it's hard to do if you've never driven a stick before. Mm -hmm. So um you gotta do brake, gas, and, and you just gotta go. Uh, he just kept punching me all the when I was driving and I do remember uh one time I drove and he hit his head on the dashboard or something. I thought that was pretty cool. He was trying not to laugh. <laughs> and then I was trying really hard not to laugh because they needed to punch me even harder. And I remember going to the store and he was like, bring me some, bring him something out of there. I can't remember what it was, chips or something. And um, I barely had money from whatever it was and he didn't offer me any. So I go in the store really fast, trying to make, not make eye contact with anybody, pay for the stuff and run out of there as fast as I can. Wow. Wow. This very, very controlling. And you said, well, thank God there wasn't a car right behind you when you were right. on the hill. Because right. you don't know what would have happened had you went backwards and hit someone else's car. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, 
So later on, you're sitting there watching a movie called The Burning Bed. Yes. What were you thinking as you were watching this movie? I was thinking I've seen the movie before. And the first time I watched the movie, it was just so sad. It, it just made me want to cry. Um, but this time when I was watching the movie, it was different. I'm watching the movie and, this, and Farrah Fawcett is uh, being beat up and she leaves the guy and comes back or whatever. She does her thing. But that part where she uh, starts to pour that gasoline around the bed, I'm sitting up in the bed and getting excited. Like, yeah, get him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really exciting. I was really happy for her to burn him up in that bed. And then it made me think, hmm, that's interesting. Maybe that's something I could do. Then I could get out. Because this woman in the movie was being abused. Just yes, she was being abused really bad. And she had children. Wow. Um, you're then promoted in the Air Force and you end up moving. Uh, Mr. Accident asks you to come over for dinner and you agreed. Um, what was the breaking point for you when you went over there? What was that, that aha moment that you had when you went over there? So I go over there thinking, I'm a big girl now, I can handle whatever he dishes out. And he's cooked dinner, set the table. He's never done any of these things for me. He set the table, it looks all nice, dinner was excellent, dinner was good. So we ate dinner, we're sitting there watching TV, talking for a few minutes, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking, okay, I really, I'm really ready to go, how am I going to get out of here? And, um... I said, oh, I forgot I had to do so-and-so. So I stand up to get ready to go. He's like, oh, I want to show you something. Come here for a minute. So we go back to his bedroom. And he opens his drawer. And there's three guns in there. Three guns. Three guns. Never forget that. Three guns. And then I start praying to myself, God, I am so sorry you got me out of here one time. Please get me out of here again and I will never come back. I'm sorry I was dumb enough to come back here, God. Please get me out. At this point, you're really, really scared. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Three guns. I was like, I have to get out of here. I gotta hurry up and get out of here. I gotta get out of here. And you were able to leave <coughs> willingly. He didn't try to hold you back or anything. He either. didn't that time? No. He got moved to a different office. Okay. I know you said you got your three stripes. I got my three stripes. And uh, that that night I put on my three, I sewed my, my stripes on. Okay. And the, uh, I got up, got dressed, looking nice in my uniform, went straight to the first sergeant's office. Told the first, first sergeant I was ready. Soon as I said it, he picked up the phone and called the guys in my office and had them bring their trucks and everything and go right over to his house and pick up my stuff. Wow. They pick up all my stuff. They're taking all my stuff out of, his, out of his place. And he's in the hallway, just in the back of the hallway like a scared cat or something, just crying. Crying, not everything, just crying. Mm -hmm. But... I do remember him crying before saying how sorry he was that his his mom did the same thing to his dad. I mean, his dad did the same thing to his mom and how horrible it was and all that other stuff. And he cried, but he was still beat me. And at this point, you're done. Done. You're done. Done. Um, what other warning signs or red flags were you noticing all along with your relationship with Mr. Accent? It's very controlling, manipulative, drank all the time. Um, we get angry over little things, little things that make no difference. I mean, just the little things he would get angry about. Um, I think the whole thing, I think the whole thing that we didn't mention was in the beginning, 
he was a wonderful man. Wonderful, nice looking man. He was he was really he was fun, he was generous, he took me places, he paid. Um I remember when he, he took me to the carnival and he bought me, we rode rods and laughed and played games and he won me stuffed animals. I mean, he was just, he was a really great guy. We went walking around the park and just talking. I mean, our communication just flowed. It was like something in like a rom-com or something. I mean, it was really, it was really nice. Mm -hmm. Until that night when he hit me. I mean, he was, a, he was good. No problem. And like, since that like moment, he reeled me in. And do you think because of your vulnerability of um, kind of being by yourself away from your family and then you had this, this um, guy, Mr. Pilot, who was so amazing and so he kind of scared you away with how amazing he was. Yeah. And you kind of ran into the arms of somebody who just did not treat you right. Mm -hmm. And did you ever see Mr. Axon again after that point, after you had, um, he left or you had left? Actually, I did. I saw him, uh, I saw him one night at the club when I was with my now husband. And, uh, he said something like, oh, he's just with you just to make me mad. Just to make me jealous. Because we're going to get back together. I was like, nope, not this time. Wow. But uh, I, I think he truly believed that I was going to come back. But nope, not this time. Um, you mentioned how some of us leave and never go back eventually. That was the final straw for you. You then meet an amazing man who, de who then became your now husband. Yes. How has he been a support for you since then and even now? Oh, wow. Just thinking about our first year of marriage and how he stuck in there was just truly amazing. I can remember one day I was sitting around the house just, I was like, I was like in shock. And he was like, what's wrong? I was like, I can't believe this. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. He was like, what's wrong? I was like, I haven't cried in a long time, and this doesn't feel right. He was like, you're kind of crazy, aren't you? And we laughed. And, and I was like, I was like, you just don't, you don't understand. I used to cry so much that not crying feels weird. Wow. But he has been just so loving and supportive and if I was upset about something I remember one time I told him I was like you know what this is not what I thought marriage was like I want a divorce and he was like what what did I do so he said let's do this let's sit down and talk about it tell me what I could do to make this better he didn't get mad at me he didn't raise his voice he didn't get aggressive he didn't withdraw he brought me closer to him and said let's talk about it and when he said that I was like this is weird <laughs> I, he want me to tell him my feelings my thoughts my it was crazy and you could not dare do that with Mr. Axon no way no way no way For some people that may be watching and are going going through a similar situation that you have gone through, um, that you spoke about in your book, what would you want to say to them? I would want to say to them, get a plan. Collect, not while he's in the house, collect all your important documents. Mail them to a friend, your social security card, your birth certificate, Go get another driver's license. Have all those kind of things sent to a friend. Have a plan. Leave safely. Leave safely. That means leaving maybe when he's not at home. That means leaving while the police are present. That means leaving with your friends 
and being safe, but leave. Don't stay. It doesn't get better. It does not get better. And if you need some help, there's helplines. And I even, if you're interested, there's the domestic helpline is on the back of my book. The, on the back of the book, it even lists some warning signs of, of domestic violence or domestic issues. There's, uh, there's, there's help out there if you want to get it. And after you do leave, I highly, highly, highly recommend getting counseling. For number one, for yourself so you can be whole. Number two, so you don't go into another relationship just as bad as the one you left. Um, and for the, for those who are going through a similar domestic violence situation, you can call the free 24-7 Confidential National Domestic Violence Hotline, which is 1-800-799-7233. I want to thank my guest, Ms. Clarissa Harding, for her courage in sharing her story. And you can purchase her book, Some of Us Leave, um, through Lulu Publishing. We'll list that link. Also, Amazon will list the link, um down below and we'll put her contact information if any of you want to reach out to her or share your story or have any questions. Um, thank you so much for thank watching. Thank you for having me. <laughs> thank you so much. Until next time, you're, you're watching, watching the Janae Well Show. show. <laughs> <laughs>